You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore dada. Well, congratulations to the LA Rams for winning the game. There, um, When I woke up this morning, I was surprised to see how many strong opinions there are. I mean, it's just, it's kind of, I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I had no intention of, I don't know, watching the game, being interested in the game whatsoever. It just didn't intrigue me. And I really wasn't saying that from a bitter place, you know, we're not there, whatever. It just, I just was not interested at all. But I thought the NFL did a really good job of kind of pulling me in. You know, I turned it on. Obviously, my son wanted to watch it. Even even the rest of my family was somewhat interested in it. It's a big deal. But right from the start, you know, with all the the stuff that they had um, pregame and everything else, it, it just kind of sucked me in from from the get-go. And I just thought from start to finish, everything about it, I enjoyed and I guess I was just kind of surprised to see how angry everybody was pretty much the entire time. Not everybody, but it just, I don't know. And then I woke up this morning and people are just livid. For me personally, I thought this was probably the most enjoyable Super Bowl I've seen since the Packers won. I don't really get the frustration. I know, I know there are a few Packer fans that were very upset that we weren't in the Super Bowl. I received several messages about that and that, you know, watching this was, you know, salt in the wound or whatever. I understand that. I didn't feel that way at all. I kind of have been over it since 24 hours after the Packers lost. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move on. I'm, I'm looking at 2022. I've been in 2022 in that season for a couple weeks now, and I just paused it to watch the Super Bowl and now I'm back. But, um, I don't know. I don't know. Lots of thoughts. First of all, again, congratulations to the Rams. Um, I was, rooting for the Bengals, but I did think the Rams were going to win that game. They almost didn't. I mean, the, the, it seemed like the the uh, the Bengals were, at least when it mattered, kind of in control. But, you know, when it, when it it's one of those things where when they failed to pull away or do anything with it, you kind of start to look at it and go, you know, you can't just rely on a one-score game for this long. Eventually, something's going to happen. The other thing I kind of like about it is after they won, I realized you've got a bunch of just old guys for the Rams. And this is, again, the, the Rams are everybody's all, all the all-in fans. It's their favorite team. Because according to the all-in fans, the best way to go all-in is to just go nuclear, which means literally set this up so that everything explodes and you are just nothing. This entire team is stacked with guys that are just old and have never won it. Well, again, Von Miller's won one, but it's just a collection of, of guys that are kind of, and it didn't dawn on me until I started hearing rumors that McVay might retire. And he's not old, but it's like, well, that's crazy. And then you start hearing Aaron Donald might retire. I, I, when they said, and I didn't even really hear it, my wife was like, oh, Aaron might retire. I'm like, Aaron who? He said, I don't know, Aaron. They said Aaron might retire. I don't know who that is. Like, Aaron Donald? Like, that's not possible. The dude's not even that old. He's still one of the best players in the NFL, has been his entire career. And then at the end, they, the announcer asked him, are you planning on retiring? He's like, I don't know, man, we'll see. It's like, whoa, whoa, what? Which kind of makes sense for McVay. Everybody's like, oh yeah, he's going to retire because, you know, you could probably make more money in TV and uh, it's a stable thing. And it's like, um, yeah, and also his team's going to implode. <laughs> There's, this team is going to zero real fast and he just doesn't want to deal with it. But that's how they built it up, man. That's what they did. They built it so that it's like, we, we got no draft picks, we got no money and everybody's going to be leaving. And if Aaron Donald leaves, that basically is everybody's leaving. We might as well just call that everybody. But there are a lot of guys where you look at and go, you know what? They deserve it. McVay, I mean, come on. I'm not saying he's the greatest coach in the world, but does he deserve one at this point? Yeah, I think he's paid his due. Even though I had to endure the McVay is a better coach than uh, than Lafleur is. Obviously, that was from Mr. Negative, who tried to pull that same thing last time. It was Shanahan is obviously better than um, than Lafleur is, and then Shanahan lost, and now it's McVay is better. So that's weird because McVay can't seem to beat Matt Lafleur when they play football. And he said that that was a stupid argument. So <laughs> that doesn't count. Head to head isn't how you gauge who's better than who. But yeah, I mean, McVeigh's been around a while now. 
You look at Aaron Donald. I mean, you know, anytime you get somebody who is one of the all-time greats, as much as he's kind of a jerk and obviously we're not a big fan of all the, the choke slams and everything else, and he's kind of a petty punk at times when he doesn't get his way, even that hit on Burrow, which, you know, the announcers were quick to point out that was legal because it was in bounds. I get it, but he put a lot into that. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I guess that's fine. It's, it's what you do. You get an opportunity to hit a quarterback, you do it. But I don't know. It just seems to be his MO. Either way, doesn't seem right that he doesn't get a ring. And even OBJ, I know there's a lot of negative this, that, or the other about Odell Beckham, but he is a good football player. He's been bounced around quite a bit. And the fact that he put it together. I mean, he hasn't been a very good wide receiver for a while. He's kind of just been a big name that hasn't produced. And um, although he wasn't super elite, he obviously was a big part of why they got where they are. Um, Von Miller has already been a part of a Super Bowl, but there's another guy that's just massively underappreciated. Matt Stafford, obviously, is a guy that we've all, in, in a way, we're kind of pulling for. You know, he had to endure the Lions for so many years. It's good to be able to give him one. Andrew Whitworth, another really talented guy. So the, there's plenty of people that you look at and go, all right, just give them their one, especially since you have a pretty good idea that this is not going to repeat. I mean, maybe everybody decides to come back, McVeigh and, and uh, Aaron Donald. But even then, when you look at it, and this is another reason why a lot of Packer fans were angry, these were not the two best teams. I said that yesterday. Clearly not the two best teams. We watched the game. You look at it and you go, yep, these are not the two best teams. Which again, uh, you know, Packer fans get mad about it, but it's like, this is exactly what I've been trying to prove to you since forever. The only thing you can do is build the best team and then keep your fingers crossed. There is no guarantee that the best team gets into the Super Bowl. I don't care how much talent you stack on your team, it doesn't matter. Yes, the Rams went all in and got a bunch of talent, but it still didn't make them the best team. They very easily could have got knocked out at any point. Same with the Bengals. They got a couple of different players here and there and all these different things, but they didn't acquire the best team. They played good football when it mattered, got a couple lucky breaks, and there you go, you're in the Super Bowl. It's a combination of things, a lot of which are out of your control. Even winning the Super Bowl, I mean, the Rams, they, they didn't deserve to get to the Super Bowl necessarily. I mean, they did because they got there, but deserve in a sense that a lot of fans would like to think that deserve, you know, what that means which is you have to be the best of the best. They didn't deserve to get the Super Bowl. And I don't know that, that, that they deserve to win the way that they were playing. Offensive line was straight garbage. I m- remember when this game first started and you, you're watching the Bengals shoot through the, the line of scrimmages. Their linemen are just, you know, walking in circles. I don't know what they're even doing. And it's like, here we go. The Bengals are going to win again because the team across from them collapsed. I don't believe this. And then it was just a series of back and forth forth collapses. Big surprise, the Bengals end up losing because they have the worst offensive line in football. And I'm not going to sit here, you know, and and pull an I told you so because Jamar Chase has been phenomenal and is a big part of the reason why they got where they got. And he looks like he's going to be one of the better wide receivers in that on that team for a long ter- long time. But my contention was, you know, not addressing offensive line when a elite offensive lineman is there in the draft and instead grabbing a wide receiver when you have good wide receivers coming off a year when you have a very promising quarterback that busted his ACL um, you know and it's great that they got to the Super Bowl but once again you lost the Super Bowl because of your offensive line and your quarterback went down screaming in pain holding his knee for the second year in a row after what seven eight sacks or whatever it was I know there was at least six but I'm pretty sure there was more after that in fact there was and this came out um, before the game was even over, but somebody, apparently that somebody's tracking pass block win rates, like during the game. Um, this is Seth Walder put this out. I don't know if he's tracking it or where he got this information or what, but pass block win rates, Rams, 80%. The average, by the way, he said is 60%. The Rams are at 80%. The Bengals, 14%. The lowest pass block win rate game by any team this season was 20%. The Bengals are at 14%. I don't know what they ended with, but I doubt it was much better than that. He goes on to say, Burrow's quick time to throw makes the offensive line look better than it is. When he's held the ball, they've been beat. So basically, this is one of the worst offensive line performances of the entire season. It might have been the worst. Again, the worst was 20, and probably in the third-ish quarter, the Bengals are at 14%. And again, for the Rams, the fact that they almost lost based on this doesn't bode well for the Rams. But again, this is just the reality, and it points you to a lot of different things. It, it definitely pushes me in the direction of, well, I don't know if I want to go. I want to keep talking about the Super Bowl before I fully get off of this, but it should make you think about a lot of different things when it comes to Green Bay. First of all, just acknowledge that the Super Bowl is kind of a flukish thing. 
Again, McVay's a better coach because he got to the Super Bowl. That doesn't even make sense. There's a billion factors that culminate to you actually getting to the Super Bowl, right? Being good is a thing of, of consistency over time. Better teams, you know, with better rosters tend to do better over the course of a season with a better record. Not always the case. Again, the Packers' record, I think, was a bit inflated. I don't think they were as good as their record. And there are other teams who were better than their record. But generally speaking, your record is somewhat of a reflection of a good team. But getting to the Super Bowl, man, I, I just, it's very iffy. Because it's, it's, so much of it is based on one game. And every week, I mean, every week in, the football, in, in, in football, every single week, there's games where you look at it and go, that's crazy. It's why you couldn't get me to put a bunch of money on anything. You've got the worst teams in football beating best teams in football, like on a weekly basis. That's why I say sometimes there's just no answers, man. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, just because. Just because. But anyways, again, before we delve too much into that, um, it will be interesting to see what happens with the Rams going forward. Um, I am interested to see what happens with the Bengals. There's a part of me that says, you know, there's a dynasty afoot. However, there's a couple issues with that. Number one, Joe Burrow's knee. I mean, you, you buckle your knee two years in a row. You are severely, you're looking to severely shorten the lifespan of your career. And again, I, I you know, they are extremely lucky that Jamar is as good as he is because it's the only thing holding me back from just mocking this team to no end for being so stupid as to neglect one of the worst offensive, not, not completely. I mean, they, they did do a couple things like what, go get Riley Reef or something, who's been exceptionally mediocre. But um, the, the other problem that I have with this entire notion is I've never really respected the Bengals organization. The, the ownership and the leadership and everything else has been poorly run. Um, I think they hit a home run with Joe Burrow, but in order for them to continue this, not only does Joe Burrow have to continue to play and be healthy and all that stuff, which is certainly not a guarantee. We'll see how he's able to do and um, his mental state with his ability to play at a high level with the concern that he has. I mean, I, I, I don't know how confident he's going to be moving forward. If this requires surgery or anything, that's going to be pretty devastating. But to trust in their ability to build, because they do have some issues. I mean, their defense played incredibly well. You watch that defense after listening to my podcast and think that guy doesn't know jack squat because this is an elite defense. I mean, you look at the way they played the run and the pass rush and everything about it made it, they made it look like this is the best defense in football. But again, you can look at the players. These are not a dominant group of players. and and they're going to have to improve a lot of these positions. I mean, the free agent acquisition of Trey Hendrickson was a brilliant one. He had an incredible season, but um, you, you can't simply depend on picking early, which again, you're not, now you're not picking early because you're a playoff team. So you don't get the, the Joe Burrows and the uh, Jamar Chases. So what do you do now? You live off a of free agency, you have to build the offensive line. And I'm talking about like five spots you got to continue to build up the defensive line and probably some corners and everything else. And I just don't know that I trust the leadership of that team to be able to pull that off. Maybe they will. I don't know. It'll be something to, to watch. The, um, and I think it's the final note. I guess I don't know. Oh, no, it's not. One of the biggest complaints that I've seen, aside from you know the anger that the Packers aren't in this, which again, j just to hammer home that point, a lot of the concern is the Packers are upset because they could have beat these teams. That's true. Also, the 49ers probably could have beat these, the, the Bengals and the Chiefs and the Bills certain, and the Titans certainly could have beaten the, the Rams. Pretty much every playoff team could have beaten any of these teams in a difference. And the Tampa Bay could have walked all over the Bengals. Um, so yeah, it's not just the Packers, right? It hurts even more because we could have beat these teams. Yeah, anybody could have beat these teams because they're, they're not that good, but they're still in the Super Bowl, aren't they? So that doesn't bother me as much. But the biggest thing that I've seen that re really is setting people off is the refs. And that I don't really understand. I woke up this morning to an email saying, you know, a guy that's been a fan since uh, 83, I think it was 83, um, attended games, attended Packers training camps, just a complete diehard and will never, ever watch the NFL again, will never attend another Packers training camp, will never be involved with the NFL ever again because it's rigged because of the refs. And he goes on to say, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I literally don't. <laughs> I don't. I mean, if, if this was the NFL being rigged, I, I mean, every game in the NFL is rigged. And maybe that's the point, but I, I just, the only thing I could think we're talking about is the, the pile of flags that came at the end. Um, of the, I don't know, three-ish that were thrown, I think maybe only one was questionable. There were maybe two others that were pretty blatant. 
But I think the the assumption is, well, they didn't throw any flags all day, but they wanted to continue to make this a game. So they, or or they wanted the Rams to win, so they kind of forced this touchdown. But uh, several issues. Number one, the the most blatant call in the game was a non-call against, you know, perpetrated by the Bengals against the Rams. And it ended in a touchdown, right? It was it was great coverage. It was, I think, T. Higgins, whose name I don't even want to utter, grabs Jalen Ramsey's face mask and rips him across his body, throws him to the ground, catches the ball, and then runs in for a touchdown. So not only was it pass interference, but it was pass interference via ripping somebody's face mask. So if it's bias in favor of the Rams, you kind of got to explain that one to me. And just in general, not throwing any flags. I mean, the, the, the Bengals were winning the entire, well, not at the entire game, but I mean, it, it really looked like the, the Rams couldn't do anything. And there were no th- flags. And I'm sure there's, o- there's always opportunities to throw flags. They were choosing not to. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if they'd been trying to prop up the Rams, they could have done it a long time ago. So that's number one. Number two, again, is that some of those were pretty obvious calls down at the, at the end. There was one, I think there was a holding, where he did have his arms wrapped around him. Um, it might have been a little ticky tack, but it, it wasn't a complete phantom call. It was just kind of little ticky tack, which again, they've kind of been letting people play. So it seemed a little out of character that they throw the flag on that. But I don't know. I mean, the refs are human beings too. They're maybe down there looking at it going, you know, th- this is, this is crunch time. We can't not be calling blatant call or, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's a, a massively big deal. And then the third issue with that is it doesn't force them to throw a touchdown. I mean, if you if he, he, you still have to execute on some level, and beyond that, the Bengals had plenty of opportunity to come back. The Bengals had a chance; they were driving down the field, and they didn't execute. There was more than enough time, and that first play got them about halfway down the field. And I'm sure if if the refs were super worried about it, they could have thrown a penalty for holding at some point. They didn't. They let it play out. At least I think I don't know. Maybe there was a penalty on the Bengals. I, I don't recall. I don't want to get blasted for that because my memory is garbage. But I I, I thought it was very well officiated almost the entire game. Uh, the, the, again, the worst call was a no call, which is always the best call. I, don't, I would rather that than a phantom call because, I mean, if you don't see it, you don't see it. I just don't like when people start making things up. But um, again, it's, it's not that I don't understand there being some frustration, but the fact that there were like five penalty flags thrown in the entire game, and I get the most angry email I've ever seen at refs for not even a Packer game. A game that we have really no vested interest in. I mean, maybe he had a bunch of money on, on the Bengals. I don't know. But I've never received a message about somebody that angry, including for Packers games, at referees. And, and it's just, I mean, I, I saved another one here just because I was on Twitter and I saw a bunch of these. But without naming names, again, the refs cheated. A petition is coming soon. Send the L.A. team back to St. Louis or share the same stadium with the Patriots. I, I, I don't even know what that means necessarily. But again, just, oh, they, they cheated. This is rigged. All It's like, I don't. Again, I, I just, I don't, I don't get it, man. There, there's a lot of people angry for a lot of really random reasons. I just enjoyed my day. I thought I had a really good day. I enjoyed the Super Bowl from start to finish. Um, halftime show is something that, I mean, it's just, it's an annual tradition to argue about the halftime show. You got people saying this is the greatest halftime show I've ever seen in my entire life. And then you got a bunch of people saying this is the most garbage halftime show I've ever seen. Usually I'm on the garbage side, um, but I did enjoy this one. But I, I honestly could see it either way. I mean, obviously, if you don't like um, them, then you're not going to like the halftime show. I think it was one of the more underproduced halftime shows I've seen, but I think I kind of liked that aspect of it because usually it's just overproduced. There's just so much going on. It's, it's too try hard. And there were a couple parts that were a little try hard. There was, the, there was the one guy who I don't even know who he is. Oh, Kendrick Lamar, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I know the name. I don't know anything about him, but that was a little overproduced. And I, I didn't know the song, so I didn't like the song. And it was just kind of weird with all the, the weird dancers and just a whole lot going on. That, that felt Super Bowl halftime-y to me, and I didn't like it. But Dr. Dre and Snoop and Eminem in particular, there was no production whatsoever. It was just like older guys just hanging out on a stage, just kind of walking around. Like Snoop Dogg in general was just, I mean, they're, they're just kind of walking around smiling. There was nothing produced about that. There's no backup dancers. There's no crazy graphics. There's no crazy set. It's just, I mean, the, the set was kind of cool, but... He's mostly just standing up on a stage, just kind of hanging out. It felt really laid back, and I kind of liked it. Plus, you know, it's, I had Blaine send me this thing. Um, looks like it's from Twitter or whatever. But he says, everybody born between 1985 and 1995 
saw the Super Bowl halftime show lineup as like, sweet, instead of doing a show for old people like the Rolling Stones or Paul McCartney or the Who, they did one for us young people, and then 10 seconds later it hit us. And that was <laughs> that was kind of me. It's like, oh, yeah. I mean, obviously this isn't new, but I, I don't really think of them as like old, you know? Like this is kind of like, what, early 2000s era? And then you kind of realize, yeah, okay, yeah, this is maybe a little bit old. For, for a lot of people watching, this is old people music. But I, I, I don't know. Again, I enjoyed it. It was, it was kind of my era music, I guess, what, whatever that even means. It wasn't like The weekend, which The weekend wasn't bad. I just don't really listen to the, I know about The weekend mostly because I hear his songs on TikTok. But I, I literally have never even heard of The weekend. I just knew of the music. I had never heard of the name of the band or the, or the person or whatever you call it. And then again, it was just massively overproduced to the point of just being kind of weird, like going through the House of Mirrors or whatever. Like, I don't, I don't understand the point of this. What is that? Then usually you've got, again, a bunch of music that's kind of not super great, massively overproduced, way too try hard. You you got like the stadium filled with people and then you walk out into the stands and it's a bunch of people on their phone not interested because the show is stupid. Again, I I didn't really get that from this. This this was actually, I thought, kind of cool. Plus it's in LA. So like this is where a lot of these people live. You know, the the set I thought was kind of cool where the, the, the aerial view was the city, which was, I thought, pretty cool. Again, it was it was underproduced, and as far as a quote-unquote performance, it was pretty boring. I mean, it looked like old people that really just didn't feel like performing anymore. Like, like this is a small venue for them, and they just were kind of hanging out. But again, I kind of like that aspect of it. You got Snoop kind of just standing around, smiling, occasionally busts into a little crip walk kind of thing, and that's about it. That's, that's the extent of Snoop Dogg's um, performance. He's kind of standing there, he's like, I'm just going to do a little crip walk here. Do it for the kids, you know. That, that was it. It's funny, I, I could almost hear, like, the people at the NFL Network really trying to come up with this amazing thing, and Snoop's just like, nah, I'm not doing that, that looks stupid. How about backup dancers? No, no, I don't, that's, are you kidding me? Do you understand anything about who I am or what I do? Get out of my face. What if we had you fly in on a dinosaur? I'm going to punch you in the mouth if you give me one more idea. I will stand there and, and, and rap. That's what I will do. How about you wear this? How about I wear whatever I feel like? Same with Dr. Dre. Like, we got, a, we got an outfit for you. No, nah, dude, I'm going to wear a black t-shirt. Well, we, we, we thought maybe you could wear this long coat. It's 75 feet long, and it'll drag across the entire football. No, I'm going to wear a black shirt. That's it. Will you fly in on a dinosaur? No. No, I won't. Actually, no. 50 Cent apparently went along with the other. He didn't realize he could say no. He's hanging upside down like a freaking bat. No idea why. Obviously, that was the NFL's idea because they're idiots and they come up with really stupid ideas. 50 Cent's hanging upside down watching as Snoop Dogg's just kind of standing around going, I didn't know, why, why isn't he, fly? I thought he was going to be on a dinosaur. I don't understand. Why do they get to say no to stuff? Why am I hanging upside down? I don't, I don't get this. People thought he looked a little heavy. No, it's just the blood all just flowed to his head because he was upside down for like a half hour waiting for his little skit to start. He didn't gain weight. His head was just swollen. And then Mary J. Blige, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that alone. It was fine. I just maybe could have gone in a different direction with that one. I don't know. But again, overall, usually what the NFL does is like they, they make a stake, if it's even a stake, which is the, the actual music, and then they just completely drown it in A1 sauce because they think their production value is the most important part. And uh, no, you should just let the stake be the star. And again, probably against their will, that's what they did. And that's what I kind of appreciated about it. Finally, before we take a break, real quick, the commercials, usually a massive letdown. And, and again, maybe, maybe I was just in a good mood yesterday because they weren't anything super special. I think one of the things that annoys me about the Super Bowl commercials now, not really annoys, but it's just, it's kind of how I feel about movies these days too. It's just, everything is just lazy. You know, back in the day, Super Bowl commercials were even if they weren't the best in the world, it was, it was, they were usually kind of funny and just off the wall and very unique. And then it seemed like as time went on, it, it really just went really, really off the wall. And that was kind of the way it was, like super crazy stuff. And it was to the point of maybe being just crazy for the sake of crazy in a way that it didn't make sense. And now it seems like Super Bowl commercials are just, let's do normal commercials, but with like celebrities. Like, let's pay a billion dollars to get every celebrity we can to play every little minor cameo role. You know, like the guy blowing leaves over there is uh, Jack Nicholson. I don't know if anyone's even going to notice, but let's give him a half a million dollars to go blow leaves for, for a day. So it, it, just, it just feels lazy. And again, it's, it's like movies where it's like everything's just a remake or a Marvel movie. Like it's uh, such and such part seven, the return. And it's people who are, I mean, at Jurassic Park, that's the, the big movie that's coming out. What is it? Let's bring the old guys back. 
Do I kind of want to watch it as a result? Yeah, I guess. But again, it's Jurassic, Jurassic Park ni- Part 19 with the old people coming back. It's just the laziest stuff. And then Marvel movies, which again, another big advertisement, Marvel movies. I, they, they do not really come out with very many new ideas. And that's kind of what a lot of these commercials are. But again, I kind of, I didn't, I didn't hate any of them. They at least make, keep it interesting with like old people in it. Cause it's like, oh yeah, it's Steve Buscemi. That's funny. I mean, not literally because this commercial is not funny. I don't even know what's going on right now. Like Peyton Manning was bowling and I, I recognize like two out of the 50 very obvious celebrities. Cause they give them like this big camera shot. Like, Ooh, look who it is. I'm like, Oh, who's that? I don't know. Sorry, you paid a lot of money for me to go, what, wh- I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what that commercial was. I just remember Peyton Manning was bowling, and a bunch of people were there, and I don't know who any of them were, except him and, I think, Buscemi. However, a couple that stood out that I liked, I thought that NFL kind of claymation he one was pretty cool, um, which had, you know, a bunch of players. I know Devontae was in it, at least as far as his clay. I don't know if it was actually clay. It looked like a, a modernized claymation kind of thing. I don't know. But then, you know, you got the baby tackling him, which was pretty funny. Still don't exactly know what that was for the NFL. I don't know what it was advertising, but that one I thought was decent. Um, As far as sort of the throwback uh, celebrity ones, two of them stood out as ones that I kind of liked. One was the Dr. Evil one, because at least it was kind of a nod to like back in the day. So I kind of at least appreciated that one. Was it funny? No, I I thought it was just kind of sad because everybody just looks really old and the jokes were really stupid and not funny and even seemed like Mike Myers was really bad. Like it was a terrible um, Dr. Evil impression he was doing. Like, apparently he got to an age where it's like, he can't even do that anymore. If somebody did that impression for me, I'd be like, yeah, it wasn't bad, I guess. Not, not very good. I wouldn't say that to their face, but in the back of my mind, I'd be like, you're bad at impressions. That sucked. But again, it was kind of a, you bought my appreciation with that one. The other one was a Chevy Silverado commercial for, uh, that was like the Sopranos. That was kind of cool. Again, it's just throwing money at something to create a, a good commercial. It's not creative. It's just, Let's just buy the Sopranos and, and do it for a Silverado commercial. It's good. You get zero points for creativity, but I'm still going to give you a tip of the hat because that was pretty cool that they brought back the two kids from the Sopranos. I didn't even realize that was her at first. And then right at the end, I was like, oh, that's uh, what's her name? And then she gets out of the car and the brother's there and they gave each other a hug, which was also kind of cool because you kind of felt like they haven't seen each other in a while. And obviously, um, the what's his name from the Sopranos passed away. So it just, it felt kind of cool. Like it was a mini reunion. But I think my favorite was the Doritos commercial. The one where the animals start eating it and then dancing and stuff because that felt like the only actual Super Bowl commercial. Like to me, that's a Super Bowl commercial. That felt like what every 90s Super Bowl commercial was. It was off the wall and just kind of funny and one of those things that people talk about afterward. Like, what the heck was that? Like, I don't know, dude. They ate Doritos and then they're like, whoa, we're crazy now. Oh. (laughs) I don't know. I just, I just liked it. It's one of those where people come into the next room and they're like, what is it? What is going on? You know, it just captures everybody's attention. Then they, they ask you like, what is going on? Why are they doing it? Like, I literally don't know. Like, have you been watching the whole thing? Yes, I have. I don't know what, I don't know what's going on. And I kind of expected that sloth to just be like super fast now, which he did at the end. But it's like, that's not really what happened. He just kind of went, and then all the other animals heard that and they're like, ooh, I want some. And then they did it too. And it's like, what does that mean? Do they have superpowers now? Like, what, what's going to happen? Nothing really. Nothing. It's just, it's just kind of crazy. And I feel like Doritos kind of always kind of hit on those. They've kept that sort of 90s Super Bowl tradition alive of let's just do kind of wacky stuff. They've had some good commercials. Even through this era of Super Bowl commercials suck now, I feel like Doritos has kind of hit the mark. So um, my award for best Super Bowl commercial is going to go to the Doritos because they didn't just pay for, as far as I know, they didn't pay for anybody. Maybe the, the person that made a, that showed up that was a human was a celebrity. I have no idea. But they didn't just throw a billion dollars at celebrities and go, let's just call this a commercial. No, they came up with something weird and creative, and I enjoyed it. Anyways, I think that's basically all my thoughts for the the Super Bowl. Again, it was the first one I didn't uh, hate in forever. There was nothing I didn't... The the only thing I didn't like was the ending. And not even just because the Bengals lost. I just remember it was fourth and one and just thought, man, it could really end on a fourth and one. Like, that would be a terrible ending to a Super Bowl. Like, you you can't execute a run play, or, or if it's a pass, then it's like, oh, that was a stupid decision. Sure enough, it was a pass, and he had to hold on to the ball, and he got hit by Aaron Donald, and it's like, well, that that's just expected. One of the worst offensive line performances, and I don't know how long, plus he, there was like, of the six sacks, I think five of them came in like the second half, probably four of them in the fourth quarter, and you're going to throw a pass on fourth and one? I mean, I understand the clock and all that, and you just failed to convert the last time you ran. You don't want to burn your last time out on a run, but it's also part of the reason why they probably wouldn't really expect it. 
You know, I mean, the Rams are in a tough spot defensively, too, because you want to stop the run, but you also know there's a good chance they're going to pass because, I mean, that's the strength of their offense to begin with, number one, plus the clock. So they're, they're, they're going to be hard-pressed to completely sell out on stopping the run. Plus, they spread out the ball. They, I mean, they spread out the receivers. So, I mean, if you're going to sell out to stop the run, that's kind of a risky proposition because if they throw it and you're selling out to stop the run, you're, you're not defending their biggest strength and you're not defending the clock and you're not really defending the end zone very well. So if I'm the defensive coordinator, I'm, I'm, my number one priority is stop the pass and then trust your guys up front like Aaron Donald to do their best, which again puts the Bengals offense, who has run the ball really well in a prime position to convert a fourth and one. Usually you're, you're up against a stack box. This is one of the few times when you're, you, the, the numbers advantage, even if it's not 100% in your favor, it's pretty light for a, for a general, for a normal fourth and one situation. But it ended like that, and I just thought that's, that's kind of a crappy ending to a Super Bowl. An incomplete pass is how it ends. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a break? I'm kind of running out of time here, and we've got another half to, to do, but we'll move away from the Super Bowl. Uh, once again, uh, check out my pinned tweet on Twitter to go help Drew to get his seizure service dog. Do not forget about amodernfrontier.com, where you can buy all your meat needs, pork and beef and whatnot. Use promo code MEATPACKER, one word, all caps. You get $25 off. We'll take a break, and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. If you're wondering what I spent my break doing, I was watching a Crip Walk tutorial. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, it was just it was sitting there. I don't know. I think the thing I didn't like about that is I feel like I always felt like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's always the same. I just felt like crip walking was a general thing. Like there's, it, there isn't a, an official dance for it. Maybe there is. I don't know. Do they really do the same thing every time? I just kind of thought it was a, a, a freestyling thing where you just kind of look a certain way, but I don't know. Maybe they, maybe it is the same dance every time. By the way, I said I was going to move on. I guess this is somewhat of a transition, but it, it goes without saying this is a very tired thing, but let's, go ahead over it because it's being said so many times that I'm sure there's a good portion of Packer fans and therefore a good portion of listeners that think that this is a legitimate argument. Here we go. Matthew Stafford literally spent 12 years with the Detroit Lions and now has the same amount of Super Bowl rings as Aaron Rodgers. I I don't know how many different ways I can say this. I really don't. And it, it seems to not matter because it doesn't go away. There are certain people who believe the Super Bowl is the only metric, right? How do you judge a, a, a coach by the Super Bowls? Right, again, I, what did I hear yesterday? That uh, the two coaches in the Super Bowl are better than Matt LaFleur. And my question is, well, how do you know that? Well, because they're in the Super Bowl. So that's the criteria. You can't say Aaron Rodgers is better than Matt Stafford because they have the same Super Bowls. Why? Because the this, this Super Bowl is the criteria. 
I'm sorry, man. I, and I, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a complete loss. The fact that this is just going to continue on and it's never going to stop. I don't know what else to say other than you don't have a very good perspective on how this works. You just don't. And I've tried to explain it and I've tried to make this make sense. Um, we talked about it even today about how the Super Bowl is completely fluky. It's, it's like judging a player based on interceptions. You know, the one year Kevin King had a bunch of interceptions. I think he had like five. Or the year that Kyler Fackrell had like 12 sacks or whatever it was. Does that mean Kyler Fackrell was better than all these other? But no, just like it what didn't mean Kevin King was an elite player that year. I mean, he, he had a good year, but it was largely because he had a bunch of interceptions. But interceptions are fleeting. And again, we're, we're basing it on a stat of five. You can't judge a person's career based on a stat that, it, that is a single digit number. Same reason I don't really like sacks all that much, although those can get up into the 20s, so it becomes a little bit more uh, whatever. Plus, you don't usually accidentally get 21 sacks. You can accidentally get five interceptions. You don't really generally accidentally get... Once you, once you start getting into the, I don't know, above 15 maybe, it kind of gets to be. But even then, it's not the greatest metric. But, but the whole Super Bowl thing, and, and again, it's, there's so many facts. This is what people just refuse to acknowledge. And I think it's just people that want to prove a point. They don't, they're not trying to be serious. They're not trying to make sense. They're just, they, they, they're just angry, and they feel like this is a, a way to prove that I'm right to be angry, even though they're not. This, doesn't, this just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean anything. So what does that mean? It's true. So, so what? What does that mean? Is Stafford as good as Rodgers? Well, they got the same amount. Of, so what? Tell me why he's as good. I don't care about the Super Bowls. Why is Matt Stafford as good as Aaron Rodgers? As a quarterback. Talk to me about being a quarterback. The ability to play the quarterback position. Tell me about that. Not about the team won a Super Bowl. And it's funny, too, because on one hand, we're, we're giving credit to uh, McVay as though McVay did the whole thing. And then the next minute, we're giving all the credit to Stafford. And then the next minute, we're giving all the credit to these free agent acquisitions because they went all in, and that's why they won. Gee, it almost seems like there's a big pile of reasons that all came together. Not to mention, part of those reasons have to do with the opponents. You don't get there if the opponents stop you, but they didn't. And it's not all you. It's sometimes them a little bit, right? I mean, again, Packer fans are mad because we could have beat these teams. You're right, we could have. And we could have beat Matt Stafford, and he wouldn't be in there, and he wouldn't have a Super Bowl ring. And it wouldn't have anything to do with Matt Stafford. It would just be simply the, the Aaron Rodgers didn't fall apart in that final game, and the special teams didn't play like garbage. That's really all it took. And then we go on to play the Rams, probably beat the Rams, like we've done consistently. And then what? Suddenly Aaron Rodgers is elite and Matt Stafford isn't? We're going to sum up entire careers based on the fact that our special teams had a blocked field goal <laughs> and a blocked punt? That summarizes Aaron Rodgers and Matt Stafford's career? How does any of that make sense to you? It shouldn't. And again, I, I shouldn't have to regurgitate common sense. I shouldn't have to explain to you and, and go back and dig up all the mediocre quarterbacks that won Super Bowls like Joe Flacco, but yet guys like Dan Marino with zero. Is Joe Flacco better than Dan Marino? Well, uh, yeah, I'm super, but no. The answer is no. And if you can't reconcile that, stop saying it because you make yourself sound stupid. You don't judge basically anything on Super Bowls. The only team you can do that for probably are teams that go on multiple Super Bowl runs. The Patriots are one of them. But even the Super Bowls itself are really just an, an effect. It's not the cause. It's just, it, it's just a shorthand way of showing how good they've been. But it doesn't summarize everything. You don't know that Tom Brady is the greatest because of the Super Bowls. Tom Brady's great based on what Tom Brady has done. Aaron Rodgers is great based on what Aaron Rodgers has done. Matt Stafford's career stands on its own because of what Matt Stafford has done. Was he elite with the Rams and garbage with the Lions? I mean, just, just the, the, this tweet or whatever it is kind of explains that exact point. He spent 12 years with the Lions. And what did he do with the Lions? Nothing. Why? Because of the Lions. And some, some of the failure had to do with Matt Stafford. Some of the success had to do with Matt Stafford. Same with the Rams. Some of the reasons the Rams weren't as good throughout the year as Matt Stafford. Some of the reasons they were great is because of Matt Stafford. It's just such a tired and boring thing. And then, then there's just been a ton of Jordan Love stuff, which I don't even know why. I guess it's because of what's going on with Aaron Rodgers right now, but it just really flared up. You got that Bears guy who I feel like he said it a long time ago. I don't know if he just said it again or if it got rehashed again, but um, said that Jordan Love was the worst pick in NFL, which several people have said this, the worst pick in NFL history. That is, be, that is one of the dumber things I've seen. I mean, he went on to later say, uh, no, 
Mitch Trubisky wasn't a worse pick. That was one of many worse picks. Mitch Trubisky was so much worse than Jordan Love, it's not even close. Again, at worst, Jordan Love is a pick that didn't pan out, which happens all the time in the first round. So what? Yeah, well, look what it did for Rod. What, what did it do? Well, it made Rodgers mad. Did it? So what? Did Rodgers leave? No. Did the Packers suffer? No. N- nothing negative happened, except we didn't get production out of that pick, which happens all the time. The Bears were handcuffed to a garbage quarterback that caused them, including in 2018 when they had a real shot, caused them to suck. They also missed out on massive opportunities. We did not. I'm sorry, but you can't compare Pat Mahomes and T. Higgins. Which, by the way, I've never seen so much love for like a wide receiver three or four in my life. <laughs> I, as soon as he went and got a touchdown, I was like, oh, look at who got a touchdown. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's what wide receivers do. They get touchdowns, just like MVS, just like uh, Alan Lazard. That's what he would have done here, too. He would have been a wide receiver four, and he would occasionally catch touchdowns. That doesn't make the difference for our team, though. And it's funny how many people are just completely dunking on the pick. And it's just, we don't know what's going on with Aaron Rodgers yet. I cannot believe 40 minutes went by. It was just, it was just four o'clock. And I'm like, well, I got to hurry up because I was like, well, at least I got an hour. I should be able to get it. It's 441. I don't understand how that happened. But we we don't know what's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers, which means... If Aaron Rodgers does end up leaving, which I'm on record saying I don't think that's going to happen, but if he leaves, then everything you guys are saying is, is dumb. At least wait until Aaron Rodgers gets inked up and then say it was dumb. But even then, if it's a two-year deal, have you seen how many people have pointed out that you've got current draft picks that are older than Jordan Love? So there's a team right now that is going to draft Kenny Pickett in the first round. He's older than Jordan Love is currently. If Aaron Rodgers plays two years and then Jordan Love takes over, so what? I mean, it's not ideal. But it, it still doesn't mean, well, then we got to get rid of him. Why? Well, because it f- failed pick. Well, that doesn't make sense. It's why, why do we have to get rid of Jordan Love? You think he's going to be expensive? You think we're going to pay a billion dollars for a backup? You think somebody else wants him real bad? Why can't we pay to keep him? I'm, 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 I'm acknowledging it's not ideal, and it's not what the Packers had planned for him. But why do we have to get rid of Jordan Love? We don't. We might. I don't know. I mean, they'll probably want to look at a different younger quarterback, which again is going to make people angry again, because how dare you ever draft a quarterback when Aaron Rodgers is here? Because apparently that's a thought that people have. And no, he was not in his prime when we drafted Jordan Love. The team was a disaster. We were falling apart. We couldn't even win, uh, get to a winning record. Aaron Rodgers was already disgruntled and he was nothing like an MVP quarterback. Probably hadn't been a really great quarterback since what, 2014? But again, selective memory. People just want to be mad for whatever reason they feel like being mad. But it's, it's, just, it's just a weird thing. Pe- people are just angry about the most random things, and I, and I don't get it. But again, I think it all stems back to Super Bowls. If the Packers don't win a Super Bowl, we have to figure out why. Because nobody can just accept that sometimes other teams win. There's no formula for, for this is how you absolutely have to win. You know how I know? Because nobody can apply what the Rams did into the future. Not honestly, they can't. In fact, you can't even apply what the Rams did in the past. Give me the formula that the Rams did. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find a team that did it this year and lost. There is no formula. But people refuse to accept that there is no concrete answer. So when the Packers lose, they go out and they try to find that thing. What is that thing that somebody did wrong? Somebody wronged me and I'm going to figure out why. It's Jordan Love. We didn't pick T. Higgins or Patrick Queen or whatever favorite pick you had. If we would have done that, we would have won. If we would have fired Murray Drayton, we would have won. Whatever it is. I don't know what it is. But there always has to be a thing. And I'm sorry, there doesn't have to be a thing. But anyways, I do want to touch on a little bit this um, Aaron Rodgers thing. There was one thought I had, and I forgot who it was. Somebody on Twitter, um, they just made a comment. And it kind of got me thinking a little bit. Oh, it was uh, Matt Larson from Packers Without Borders. I don't even remember what his comment was, but it was, it was on something. And when I first saw his comment, I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. But I kind of just ran it out in my head, and I'm like, eh, maybe. Here, here's what it was. So it all kind of stemmed from Andrew Brandt. Andrew Brandt's putting a lot of stuff out there about the Packers, and I don't think a lot of it is... <sighs> I'm not really tracking him on this very well. <sighs> He's saying stuff that I can't quite put together, and JJ was sending it over to me, and I was trying to kind of think it through there, and I, I think I know what he's getting at, but I'm not entirely sure. But he's putting a lot of stuff out there. But anyways, Sam Holman, who does some uh, good breakdown work, and he's been on the podcast and on YouTube and whatnot, he says, another thing that doesn't add up to me, why are they putting all this out into the open? If they wanted 12 back and wanted to trade love, they could do it quietly. Acting so publicly 
desperate to keep 12 would, I assume, negatively affect Love's trade value. And then Matt responded, see last offseason's uh, show. Got to use my button. His, his, his blank show, whatever. Fiasco, let's put it that way. Anyways, the, the, the point of this is, I just wanted to give him credit because that's where it, it started there. I don't even know how I connected the dots from there. But the point is, I, I started thinking about that fact and, and how if you're trying to move on from Aaron Rodgers, why would you so publicly be talking about all this stuff that's going on? It doesn't make sense. I've, I've said that several times on this podcast. You're not going to publicly say, we want him, 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 and then trade him. And Andrew Brandt, again, he keeps, he, he keeps kind of pointing at, it's weird that they're doing this so publicly because they never do that, but somehow his conclusion seems to be, therefore, they're trading Rodgers, and I don't know how he connects those dots necessarily. But uh, here's kind of where I'm at. And again, JJ kind of helped me add to this as well. But this is as far as I got yesterday as far as another theory that could include moving on from Aaron Rodgers. Number one, the Packers last year had no choice. They decided last year that they needed to keep Aaron Rodgers. The only way to do that was to make him happy and to do so publicly. Now, apparently they offered him a really big contract and Aaron Rodgers didn't accept it. That is a big point here. Why did he not accept the the contract that was on the table? Especially assuming, and remember, this is, this is another point. Let me, let me just do a quick sidebar. I talked yesterday about Aaron Rodgers and, and um, or excuse me, Ian Rappaport's report. And then he wrote that article. And it has been spun wildly out of control and everybody is reporting it. What are they reporting? That the Green Bay Packers are offering him the biggest contract uh, or the highest paid quarterback in football. My assumption is it's the same contract they offered him last year, but it's interesting to me that he didn't accept it. That's, that's a big point here, but let me continue. So they had to make him happy. They had to keep the guy happy. So they had to do so publicly. Plus, and, and JJ was saying, I don't know why they would be so public about it. My other thought is they're being asked every five seconds. That's what's different about this year. Number one, they have to keep the guy happy. Number two, the Packers are being asked, are you going to trade him? Well, what are they going to say? How do you not be public about it? If you say, I don't want to talk about it, that's not going to make Rodgers very happy. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's kind of a, I don't know. You can't say that. The answer is no. Because again, our number one goal is we want Rodgers happy. So if your options are, if, if, if what you want to do is keep Rodgers, then, then you're good. But what if you want to trade him? Well, again, you can't publicly talk about how bad we want him. We just, we got to keep him. We would be stupid to let him go. And then just flat out be like, ah, never mind. But what you can do is you can offer him a contract that he will not accept. Which is to say, you could offer him a, con- I mean, a legitimate contract that you would be willing to offer. Like, for example, they did offer Jordy Nelson a contract. Apparently, it was a very offensive contract, though. It was a contract that uh, the Packers essentially said, we would be willing to take you back, but this is what we would be willing to take you back at, knowing pretty well that Jordy was not going to accept. But, you know, in other words, we're pretty sure you're not coming back, and we kind of want to put it on you for saying no to an offer we put out there. But if you did accept it, I mean, we'd be fine, but at this price. They could do that with Rod. They could offer him and say, look, we, we kind of want to move on. And uh, I mean, if you say yes to this, then I guess we're fine with it because this is a garbage contract. And so you offer him a contract that you're pretty sure he won't accept. And if he does, you're okay with it because of the structure of it that, that is very um, in the team's favor. But if he doesn't accept it, then what? Then he turned you down. And so now you, you know, you're in these intense talks. And Rodgers gets frustrated with the talks, and he says, you know what, just trade me. And the Packers are like, well, we did everything we could. That is a possible scenario. Now, again, I'm not saying I think this is going to happen. I'm standing on the fact that I think he comes back. But that is interesting, especially when, again, you consider this talk about highest paid quarterback is not new. Here is an article by uh, John Breach and Jeff Kerr, CBSSports.com. This is dated July 20th, 2021. Packers offered to make Aaron Rodgers the NFL's highest paid quarterback per report. New details emerge. Aaron Rodgers has been at odds with the Green Bay Packers for nearly the entire offseason. At some point, it seemed that the Packers tried to fix the problem with their starting quarterback by offering him a lot of money. According to The Athletic, the Packers got so desperate to fix things with Aaron Rodgers, they offered to make him the NFL's highest paid quarterback. ESPN's Adam Schefter recently revealed the length of the offer, two seasons that would have kept the Packers quarterback in Green Bay for five more seasons. Rodgers would have been the highest paid player in the NFL, blah, 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 blah. Green Bay reportedly was willing to give Rodgers more than $45 million per year. Again, that's basically what people are saying the offer is now, because, again, I believe this is not a new report, but they're going off of the old report. However, continuing on, remember, this is July 20th. 
Now that Rodgers declined the offer, where does this leave things between the star quarterback and the Packers? He didn't sign it. So if what we're really talking about with this offer to make him the highest paid quarterback is that the offer still stands, the offer that you shot down last year still stands. And listen, maybe it is a great offer and Aaron Rodgers is just like, no, nah, I'm going to do this for one year and see if I even want to be here. That's possible. But it's also possible that it's because remember, Aaron Rodgers was upset that they were not giving him an offer that he wanted with the structure and everything else. So again, this is just a potential thing that's happening. I don't know. But I, I, again, I could not fathom a way in which this leads to Aaron Rodgers being traded. I just couldn't fathom that. This is one way in which that could make sense. And again, everything kind of works out for, for, for numerous reasons. Number one, from a PR standpoint, they look good. They've done everything right. They've even got Aaron Rodgers bragging about how great the Packers are. Now, again, that's a bit of a complication there because if the Packers have a, a, a nonsense offer being offered to Aaron Rodgers, and that's the only offer on the table, and Aaron Rodgers knows that. I have a hard time believing he's going to come out and just praise Gutekunst and Russ Ball and all those guys, because he can see through it all. And by the way, if you're wondering, how can you make him the highest paid and be a, a bad contract? Highest paid doesn't have to be real. It can be a lot of fake money. What are the guarantees of the contract? Right? That's, that's a big question as well. How much of this is actually real money? I mean, if you really want to make Aaron Rodgers mad, structure it so that you can get out after one year. He's going to walk away from the table that second. Unless that's what he wants at this point in his career, I don't know. Maybe he's like, you know, let's let's try it one more time, which again, I'm not on board with that, but that's a whole other thing. But it's 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 a little bit of a stretch. Um, but again, it, it helps with the PR aspect. It's a way to get what you want this year or last year, I guess, by making Aaron Rodgers happy, but also not really committing, right? You've got kind of a backdoor plan here to where you pretend to commit, but don't. The other aspect is you're kind of driving up the cost of Aaron Rodgers. And I feel like that's maybe what Andrew Brandt is getting at, because he, again, he's, he's pointing to there's a reason they're being so public, and it's not because they want to keep Aaron Rodgers. Then what are you talking about? But think about it. If, if the plan is to trade him, and, you, and other teams know that the Packers are ready to move on, what happens to the price? Well, it's exactly what Sam said the price is of Jordan Love. Well, maybe the plan isn't to trade Jordan Love, because that is true. If, if you basically say we're desperate to keep Aaron Rodgers, then that means you don't want Jordan Love. So you're killing your own ability to trade Jordan Love, that doesn't make sense. But on the other side of that, you're driving up the cost of Aaron Rodgers because he's a two-time MVP and there's nothing you can do to take him away from us, which means if you're coming to the table, you come heavy or don't come at all because it's going to take something monumental to pry him from our hands. That's what they're conveying to other teams. Again, we're kind of we're kind of dipping our toe in conspiracy theory territory because anytime you start talking about how brilliant this is, and it is brilliant, you know, kind of like that the, the, the whole 4D chess kind of thing, I tend to think that it's fake because I don't really give anybody that much credit to be, to be that brilliant, to plan all this out from, from the get-go because it works on so many levels. But it is a possibility and it is an out. And even, even if it wasn't a plan, it still kind of points to a possibility. Even if Aaron Rodgers says, I want to come back, there still has to be a meeting of the minds. They still have to come together on, a, on, a, on an agreement of a contract and maybe that won't happen. Whether or not this was the plan all along and they're trying to force him out with a bad contract or they just can't find a compromise because the Packers are so strapped and they're like, this is the best we can do. And Rodgers is like, I just know that. I mean, that's what we think is probably going to happen with Devontae, right? The Packers do want Devontae. There's no question. And Devontae would be willing to stay with the Packers, I'm sure. But the gap between what Devontae says he's worth and what the Packers are able to pay, not willing. I mean, they're willing to give him anything he wants. They're just not physically capable. And that gap is the reason that a lot of people think that a, that a um, franchise tag is going to be used. Because there's just no way that they can meet what they think Devontae is going to be willing to accept. So it's, it's kind of opened up the possibility in my mind. But again, it still doesn't make the most sense to me. There's still holes in it, right? The fact that there is a contract on the table, the fact that Aaron Rodgers knows that, the fact that Aaron Rodgers is so happy with the organization. Um, and again, I really doubt Aaron Rodgers would just be happy because they're, they're talking to him more. Again, if, if he thinks they're, they're jerking him around with a contract that he's not going to like, this is why I've, I've said, I, don't, I, I think there's, a ta there's an offer on the table that he's willing to accept. It's just a matter of whether or not he's going to come back. And maybe that's part of the contemplation. It's not the greatest offer in the world, but I think he knows what it is. I'm, I'm making that up. I don't know for sure. But again, he's really happy with the Packers organization. And I don't think that that happens unless he genuinely believes they're willing to commit to him long term. And that doesn't happen if there isn't a handshake agreement on what the contract is. And, and largely, it is the same contract as last year. Maybe it's a slightly tweaked contract in terms of the, the, the deal or whatever. But, you know, he shot down it, the, the, the deal last year, maybe just because of how things are going. And he's like, I don't know if I want to be a part of this organization. But 
now that they've proven themselves worthy, he looks at that contract and says, you know what, maybe. Let me see if I even want to play football anymore, and if so, I'll sign on the dotted line. That's still what makes the most sense to me, but at least there is a path to where I could see that not working. But anyways, I got to get out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. It is officially the off season. I said I thought it would take maybe a week to uh, for the Super Bowl cool down before we can start talking about stuff. Before we, but I mean the 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 big breaking news for the Packers and all the off season drama and everything that seems to have started before the Super Bowl even started. So I think I think we might be in uh, in full swing off season mode. Um, and look, I mean it, it makes sense. These guys, whether it be Ian Rappaport or what. Everybody's got to make money, man. And these writers got to write about something. And Aaron Rodgers is still the biggest uh, biggest draw. So at the very least, we should have some fake news coming out real soon to be able to comment on. But anyways, you guys have a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>